Hello and welcome to this video about causation. It's an introduction to causation as it relates to the elements of a crime in paper one. And so it goes along with work on actus reus and mens rea, which are the other main elements of a crime. So the definition of causation is it's the link between the defendant's act or failure to act and omission and the consequence or the result of what the defendant has done. So it forms part of the actus reus, but it's a very important topic on its own. And when you're talking about causation, there are three things that the prosecution has to prove. And this is a series of tests, really, that you need to go through. So first of all, they have to prove that the defendant's conduct was the factual cause of the consequence. And to do this, you use something called the but-for test. And this is the easiest part of causation to prove. So in addition to the but-for test, you need to go on and prove that the defendant's conduct was the legal cause of the consequence. And then finally, you need to show that there were no intervening acts which, which could break the chain of causation. It's known as the chain because of the different links between it, like the links in a necklace, and the chain goes from the defendant to the victim, and there may be things that happen in between that might break the chain. So the first thing to look at is factual causation. And you can do this by looking at the case of R against Paget. And the but for test is formulated starting with those words which you do need to try and use, but for. But it means if it were not for. And you can think that in your head. If it were not for, and then say what the defendant did, and then say the result would not have happened. So in Paget, there is factual causation as but for Mr. Paget using Gail as a human shield, Gail would not have been shot by the police and died. So that is an example of how the but for test works and how you can show factual causation. In the case of R against White, there was no factual causation because in this case, it couldn't be shown that but for Mr. White putting poison in his mother's drink, she would have died as she would have died anyway of natural causes. And this is the case where um, his mother had a heart attack before she could drink the poisoned drink, and so she was already going to die. So Mr White wasn't a cause, in fact, of what happened to her. However, he um, did, of course, face charges and was convicted of attempted murder, as it was his intention to kill her. It was just he didn't get the chance as she died um, beforehand. However, on its own, factual causation is not enough. It's only the first step, and otherwise people who are not really criminally liable could be found guilty if factual causation was the only um, test, which is why we need to go on to consider legal causation. So if you think about a scenario where, say, I invite you to a party and on the way you're assaulted... You could say that I am a cause, in fact, of the assault because but for me inviting you to the party, you wouldn't have been assaulted. However, that does not establish that I am really criminally liable for what happened um, as it is the person that carried out the assault that should be found guilty. So we need to go on and consider legal causation. And this um, can be a little bit less straightforward than factual causation. You are usually in the scenario work you're going to do um, for A-level law find that you do um, have factual causation and you're more likely to have an issue with whether there is legal causation or more, most likely of all whether there's going to be an intervening act that breaks your chain. So the two main cases on legal causation are Paget and Smith. The test from Paget asks whether the defendant's actions made a significant contribution to the result. Now significant doesn't bear the meaning that we might have thought meaning uh, quite important it's actually been held to just mean more than negligible or more than minimal. So you only need to show that the defendant has had a more than minimal contribution to the result. And so that is relatively easy to do. And this is the test, um, the significant contribution test from Paget that we use in most situations. And there is another test that was set out in R against Smith, which asks whether the defendant's act was the operating and substantial cause of the result.
And I would suggest that you use this in cases like Smith, where there is bad medical treatment. So we'll see in a minute that Smith was a case about the soldier who was stabbed and received bad medical treatment. And that potentially breaks the chain. So if you have a case where you have bad medical treatment in your scenario, then I think it's easier to use Smith. But mostly you are going to use Paget. So let's have a look at the case of R against Paget. And in that case, Mr. Paget held his girlfriend hostage and the police were involved. He fired shots at the police and they fired back and killed his girlfriend who he was using as a human shield. So his argument in that case is, well, I didn't shoot my girlfriend Gail, I didn't hurt her, it was the police that shot her. And in the case, Lord Goff said that the defendant's actions don't have to be the only cause of the consequence, in this case, Gail's death, or even the main cause. They just have to have made a significant contribution with significant meaning more than negligible or more than minimal. And clearly his actions in using her as a human shield did have a more than minimal contribution to the result of the police shooting at her and her dying. And so he was found to have been a legal cause of what happened. So the last thing you need to consider after factual and legal causation is whether there are any breaks in the chain of causation. And this in Latin is called novus actus interveniens. And the chain of causation can be broken in three main ways. The first one is by something the victim themselves ha have done. For example, running away or failing to seek medical help. Uh, the second thing is the acts of third parties, for example, doctors and nurses in medical treatment or the acts of another third party like the police, for example, say in Paget. And lastly, any other intervening acts, um, for example, an act of God like someone being struck by lightning after they've been assaulted. Um, it's much more likely that that's going to be um, relevant in civil cases, so it's not something that we need to focus on. It's worth noting here, and we'll look at the case in a minute, that the chain is not broken by the victim's particular characteristics. So if there's something about the, diff the victim sorry, that makes them suffer in a worse way than you would have expected, then the defendant is still stuck with that under the thin skull rule. You have to take your victim as you find them. So let's have a look at victim's own actions. So commonly this is things like running away in the face of an attack or as we're going to see in these cases, um, jumping out of moving cars. So if the defendant causes the victim to act in a reasonably foreseeable way, then the victim's own act doesn't break the chain of causation. So if something's reasonably foreseeable, the defendant isn't going to be able to say, well, it's not my fault anymore because they did something, if it is a foreseeable thing. So in Roberts, the female victim jumped out of a moving car because she thought that the defendant was going to um, sexually assault her. And she hurt herself and he said, well, it's your fault you jumped out of the car. And the answer to that is the victim's own acts did not break the chain of causation as it was reasonably foreseeable that a victim would react in that way when faced with someone trying to take off their clothes, threatening them and fearing a sexual assault. It was reasonably foreseeable they would jump out of the car. So the chain remains intact between the defendant and the result. And then he was found guilty for um, ABH. By contrast, another case where someone jumped out of a car um, tells us that if the victim's actions are unreasonable and unforeseeable, then the chain of causation may be broken and the defendant may be held to be not guilty. So in Williams, a hitchhiker jumped out of a moving car, hit his head on the curb and died. And it was alleged during the trial that the driver may have attempted to steal the victim's wallet, which is why he jumped out of the moving car. And the court said, that the Victims Act in this case did break the chain because the actions had to be foreseeable and also in proportion to the threat. And whilst in Roberts, what the victim did was in proportion to the threat of a sexual assault, what Mr. Williams did here was daft and unforeseeable. And so the chain was broken and the defendant was not found guilty um, in relation to his death. 
Lastly in this area is the case where the victim has neglected their own injuries either by not going to get medical help or, and just staying at home not going to hospital or they've done something that's potentially made their injuries worse and normally this is not going to break the chain of causation either as it is seen as reasonably foreseeable and an example of that is R against deer where Deer had stabbed the victim with a Stanley knife and the victim had been given stitches but then um, picked the stitches open and bled to death. And it was found that this didn't break the chain of causation as it's reasonably foreseeable that um, someone may neglect their injuries or make them worse and he was found guilty of murder. So just returning to the victim's characteristics and the thin skull rule and a reminder that this is never going to break the chain of causation. So if the victim's got something about him that makes his injury more serious, then D will be liable for the more serious injury. And case authority for that is R against Blau, where the defendant stabbed the victim um, who needed a blood transfusion to save her life. And she refused that because she was a Jehovah's Witness and her religion forbade blood transfusions. So she died as a result and the defendant was convicted of murder as he had to take the victim as he found them and couldn't escape liability by saying her refusal to take a blood transfusion was the cause of the death. So the thin skull um, rule may be found in scenarios if you see something about the defendant that where they have particular characteristics um, that make what happened worse, then the defendant just has to accept that. And moving on now to medical treatment. Now this is the um, time in a scenario where I would be considering using Smith instead of Paget. And the test from Smith as to whether the chain is broken by bad medical treatment. So in R against Smith, where a soldier stabbed another soldier and then when they were carrying him to the medical station they dropped him and then when he got there they gave him bad medical treatment by um, pressing on his lung which was punctured and he died. They said in Smith that if the second cause, in this case the bad medical treatment, is so overwhelming as to render the first cause, the stabbing, part of the history then the chain will be broken. And so they found in this case there was no break in the chain as although the medical treatment was bad it was not so overwhelming as to render the stabbing by the defendant part of the history. And if you think about it it makes sense that you would be very very slow to break a chain for bad medical treatment as it would give many defendants an argument to say well I didn't cause the injuries. Um, it was the hospital's fault. If you think about the fact in crime a lot of the time the, def the victim has been hurt by the defendant and may need medical attention, it would be too easy if we could allow all these defendants just to say, oh no, it was the hospital's fault, not mine. So it's a very, very rare case indeed where the chain will be broken. And we can see that in the um, case of Jordan. Um, just worth noting there at the bottom that the, um, the way they word it as well is they sometimes say, that the medical treatment was not separate and potent in causing death. But a case where we can see that it was separate and potent in causing death was Jordan. And this is the only reported case where medical treatment did break the chain of causation. So it is incredibly rare and you probably um, will not very often find that you are needing to break a chain. So the reason this was such a rare case was because the victim had already had an anti allergic reaction to the antibiotics, was in a position where um, the wound had almost healed. And so the court said that the uh, giving another large dose in that situation meant that what the defendant had done, the original stabbing, was no longer the operating and the substantial cause of death. And this was because the medical treatment was so overwhelming as to render the stabbing by D part of the history. And it, in other words, it was a separate and potent event in causing death. So separate from the original stabbing and potent meaning serious or important in causing the death itself. So I hope that that's been a helpful recap on causation. Just to summarise that 
the prosecution has to prove three things and you will always consider these three things when you are talking about causation. Firstly, that the defendant's conduct was the factual cause of the consequence and you use the but for test. Secondly, that the defendant's conduct was the legal cause of the consequence and usually you use Paget for that. Was the defendant's action a significant contribution to the result? And lastly, were there any intervening acts which broke the chain of causation? Thanks very much.